So you decided you wanted to get into long range shooting. Well, good on you. I think that's a great decision. Something about a bunch of small little things coming together all to just have a delayed impact and hearing a ding a couple seconds after the shot is kind of cool. Something about it. So I guess what the goal of this video is, is to have viewers that have zero knowledge into the subject of shooting long range. And by the end of this video, without it being an hour long video, be able to make effective hits, not just hits, but effective hits first round or hopefully second or third round hits at extended ranges as far as you want to shoot as far as the cartridge you're shooting allows it so it might be a lengthy video i apologize but if this just converts a couple people out there that never shot long range if this makes you go out right now and get a long range setup and start shooting long range just a couple people i will be very very satisfied or you're just watching this video because you just like long range shooting and uh you just like uh, hearing me jabber on a little bit either way so for my subscribers you guys are probably looking at this going what is this rifle can you break it down for us and instead of breaking it down right now let's build it up because like i said this was an excuse to build up this rifle for this so with that said let's talk about the selection process on how to get a rifle that not just looks cool but is a good rifle for you everything has to be about what you want to do at the end of the day here it's all personal preference that said there's gonna be a lot of divisions in the road that kind of leads up to the rifle that's best set for you so let's talk about the first one and that is bolt action or semi-automatic uh it's pretty self-explanatory semi-automatic one pull of the trigger one shot fired um and you can have box mags five ten 20 rounds, 30 rounds even, uh, and that is what it is. There's also bolt actions, and my choice, they'll both give you very, very different kinds of uh, feels of long range shooting, but they're both really, really fun. Uh, but like I said, it's kind of self-explanatory. You can engage or re-engage targets a lot quicker with this one. So if you're hunting, maybe long range feral hog hunting or predator hunting, then you might want to do this one. If you're just out there for recreational plinking, uh, I personally prefer a bolt action. They are coherently just a bit more accurate. And I personally like that idea of taking my time and appreciating each shot. Sometimes it's fun to open the bolt and load in one at a time, hand feeding it by the chamber. And it really forces you to just take your time. And like I said, nine out of 10 times are gonna be more accurate rifles anyway. So you don't have to agree with me here. Make the rifle the way you want to go, but for the sake of this video, we're running a bolt gun. Now, the choice is, do you want to get a rifle that's already built, or do you want to kind of make something that's custom, or kind of both, which is the more expensive option, and that is to get a complete custom rifle already. So with that said, you could go out and just get a factory Tika or Bergara or Remington 700 out of the box, throw a scope on it, uh, along with some other things, and you pretty much have a factory rifle you didn't do anything with. The more expensive option, would be to do what I did uh, a couple years ago. This is an Alamo Precision Rifle. This is uh, APR, then Ranger, and 6.5 Creedmoor. This is actually probably my favorite long range gun I've got. Not probably, it single-handedly is. These custom rifles can run anywhere from 2,000 all the way to even $5,000. This one ended up being about $2,200 before any accessories got thrown on it, which is actually not too bad. I believe APR's pricing did go up recently. So for the sake of this video, I'm assuming that if you guys are new to the subject, you might not want to necessarily spend thousand dollars on the bare rifle uh, right out of the gate. So let's go ahead and do probably my favorite route for someone that's kind of just getting into it. And that is custom building one yourself, not really going after all the high end parts. So that's kind of how we came with this. We're gonna start breaking this down now, but this whole setup, optics, rings, everything, as you see at muzzle break, everything was just under $1,800. So cheaper than the price of just the bare rifle. Uh, for that APR. So, you know, take that for what you will. So let's assume that now you want to piece one together and it's not complicated at all. You don't have to be a gunsmith. It's literally just screwing in some uh, components. So let's say you want to build out your own custom rifle. Now the next division in the road is what kind of feel do you want your gun to have? What kind of ergonomics? You could go with a chassis system or you could go with a traditional stock. This right here is a traditional stock from Greybow. This is called the Renegade. It's actually the exact same stock that you just saw in that camo rifle, the APR, the Greybow Renegade awesome stocks for not a lot of money and they feel great. Uh, so more often than not, I prefer that for just the streamline aspect of it. They have all the things I need. This is referred to more so of a chassis and it's actually kind of a hybrid between a stock and chassis because it's not crazy complex. A lot of times the chassis just have key mod or M lock all over the place, folding stocks, They'll have comb height adjustment, length of pull adjustment, all kinds of stuff. This is technically a chassis because the inlays are metal. This right here is an Accuracy International 1.5 or an AICS. They discontinued them, so whenever I find them, I try to buy them. They look really, really cool. Now, crazy enough, the rifle that sits in both of these are the exact same rifle. Both are factory Remington 700 AAC SDs, 22 inch barrel, 6.5 Creedmoors. These rifles cost just about $500 each. So I got the $500 rifle, I ditched the stock it came with, 
and I went ahead and put one in the AICS chassis and one in this Graybell Renegade. A huge benefit with going with an aftermarket stocker chassis, other than you personally liking the feel and everything of it, is now it allows your barrel to be free floated. So you could run a piece of paper, for example, like this, right through here, and it never makes contact with the barrel because it's now free floating. Same is true for the Renegade. So if your stock or chassis makes contact with the barrel and pushes up on it, that's gonna affect your accuracy and push the barrel up. These are free floating, that's exactly what you want. So an upgraded stock or chassis is pretty darn huge. I paid about $1,000 for this stock because I stopped making them and I'm just kind of dumb like that sometimes. The Graybow Renegade on the other hand, is awesome because they also make their bottom metal. The bottom metal is what screws under the stock to accept magazines, so you don't have to go with the five round internal box mag. This right here is a detachable box mag that holds 10 rounds. And um, the bottom metal and the entire stock itself, you'll be at just under 400 bucks. And so that's huge. Now you're looking at maybe a $500 rifle and a $380 chassis uh, setup or stock setup. That's a really, really fair price. So you heard me mention there that both of these are 6.5 Creedmoor. Now, not to get too controversial on the subject because there really is no wrong answer. I am partial to a 6.5 Creed more for beginner or intermediate, but at the end of the day, it kind of depends on just the range that you're gonna be shooting at anyway. The reason I am partial to 6.5 Creed more is because the round itself has become very, very uh, readily available and really not terribly expensive, but the uh, efficiency of the round and how well it flies and how accurate it can be on certain loads is unbelievable. So I'm very, very happy with the 6.5 Creedmoor. However, uh, you can have a great time shooting long range with a bolt action or semi-auto 223. That's the truth. So if you only have 500 yards accessible to you, you might even be well with a two, uh, 22 long rifle, uh, truth be told. So you can kind of see how the rifle's starting to come together. It's a factory Remington 700 AAC SD 22 inch barrel 6.5 Creedmoor. Cool thing about that is it came from the factory threaded for a muzzle brake or a suppressor, whatever you like. We'll explain the benefit of that later. Cool thing is with the Remington 700, there's so many chassis and stocks out there that allow it to just drop in and screw in. Uh, the Graybow Renegade is one of those. Now, next thing to know when you're picking out a rifle or the uh, you already have the rifle, you're picking out a stock or chassis, is short action or long action, LASA. If you go on Graybow Renegade's website, you'll see the option to get a stock for a Remington 700 SA, which is a short action, which is gonna be a 308, 65 Creedmoor, 223, stuff like that. Long actions, a 300 Widmag, a 338 Lapua, and the likes because the cartridge is so much longer, so you need that larger opening and, and so on. So that's how you select that. If you're gonna go with this exact setup, I don't blame you, it's uh, pretty sweet. Get a Graybow Renegade Remington 700 SA. All right, so now you know. So about the twist rate, you might see on the side of the barrel, this one in particular, it should be a one in eight. Somewhere on here, it will say, I'm sure, but it should be a one in eight twist barrel. What that means, is in eight inches, which will be about right here, in about eight inches, the bullet will make one entire revolution. So if you look at the rifling inside a barrel, it's got that, that rifling twist to get that bullet spinning. The number being one in uh, eight, that's a decently fast twist, but it's a pretty standard for a 6.5 Creedmoor. 308, it's probably a one in 10. I have some 308s that are one in 12, which are a bit slower spinning. Uh, so what to know with that is the faster it spins, let's talk about a 5.56 for example, uh, not to confuse, confuse you guys too much, but this is the twist rate I know pretty well. A fast twist rate for a 5.56 like an AR-15 is a one in seven. And those, because it's twisting so much faster, they like a heavy bullet, makes sense. It's kind of like throwing a football, uh, if it's heavy and you put a lot of spin on it, that's when it's gonna be stable. If it's lightweight and you throw a lot of spin, it'll be all over the place, makes sense. Same thing with the barrel. So one in seven, likes the heavier bullets, 77 grain, I'm talking about 5.56 five, here, 75, 77, stuff like that. One in eight, it's a little bit more accepting for all kinds of stuff. One in nine likes probably 55 grain and the lighter stuff. When it comes to a 6.5 Creedmoor, they're usually one in eight, and then it kind of depends on barrel length uh, from there, but 140 grain is pretty standard. They fly out of this one really, really nicely. Uh, the longer you have a barrel, the faster it's gonna, uh, uh, the bullet will be because more of the powder got cooked off. End of the day, just go out there and group it at 100 yards and trial and error, just see what works for you. I mentioned this just a little bit ago. Let's talk about the threaded barrel and why that's a big plus. And uh, that's why I'm really impressed that it comes with that on a $500 rifle. Uh, not to mention you could sell the stock it comes with. But anyway, let's call it 500 bucks threaded barrel. That way I could put a muzzle brake on here. Um, cool thing with the muzzle brake, it's in short, it's less felt recoil. It directs a lot of the gases and blast off to the side. Maybe makes your shooting neighbors not so happy. Uh, it's kind of loud and concussive, but it really takes a lot of that recoil and blasts it out to the side. So your felt recoil is a lot less. 
The reason you want low recoil, other than just a more pleasant shooting experience, I know you can handle it, not saying anything, but the reason is because if you're on decently high magnification on a target long range and you shoot, let's say you hit, you wanna see where you hit, or if you miss, you wanna see where you miss to make the correction. And if you have a lot of recoil and you take a shot and then the next thing you know, you're looking at the sky or the ground, it's gonna be a little hard to spot your own shots. All right, let's talk about stability. So I'll explain what this is in just a second. Stability, bipod. You guys can go out there and get something that looks like a Harris bipod for like 15 to 25 bucks on Amazon. And those things are pretty good if you're just gonna run it on a, you know, kind of budget build for an AR or something like that. And when it comes to a bolt gun, you really wanna spend the money. Uh, there's a couple options out there. Harris Engineering makes this. This is probably the most famous bipod in the world. This is the Harris Engineering six to nine inch bipod. Uh, really, really nice, really adaptable. And uh, it's got the swivel feature. So if you guys can see this, you can swivel a little bit and it has the tension adjustment right here. There's other bipods out there as well. This is a little bit more primo. This is an Atlas bipod. Uh, not only can you throw it at any kind of angle like this, run it backwards. And of course this too can adjust for length with some ball bearings. Uh, but this one here can swivel side to side and then also has a panning feature. I love these things. This one in particular has a quick detach mount, but these ones go for about 300 bucks. If you've got the coin, I say do it. And they're quick detach. You can throw them around different rifles. So they're awesome. That's about 95 bucks. This is about 300, more or less. I'll probably throw some links in the description to whatever's applicable. That way you guys can, uh, can make your own mind up. But uh, whatever you go with, they're both gonna get the job done. These are among my favorite bipods, put it that way. That's stability up in the front. Let's talk about the rear stability. Uh, this is what this is right here, actually. So you could go on Amazon as well and buy like a pre-made sandbag. And I tried them out before and they don't tend to work with me too well. The best solution I've ever found is I got a couple long athletic socks uh, and I filled it up with rice and I got another long athletic sock, uh, sock and wrapped it the other way, inverted. So now I have this thing, it makes no noise. This is just a sock full of rice and it's awesome. You can manipulate it really, really well. So uh, the cool thing with this Graybo Renegade is this cutout. So you might put it here to get more of an angle. You could put it right here. You could put this this way. Cool thing is it's so, so sensitive in a good way to where you could just go ahead and pinch this and barely the back stock will rise to angle down. You can start releasing some tension. You could see the rifle just go up and down with that. So this is a really cool way to go. So just do whatever works, but a rear bag, sandbag, whatever, that's really cool. The last thing you'll need, other than of course the scope, is going to be the rail to put the scope and scope rings on. So the factory Remington 700 AAC does not come with the rail. That's probably a good thing because you could pick and choose the exact rail you want. This, I believe, was made by uh, Outer Impact. It's about, I forgot, under 50 bucks on Amazon. And so this is a rail that comes with the screws. You just screw it in and it's ready to accept your scope. Cool thing with this rail is it has 20 MOA of pre-tilt. Uh, so what that means is the rail actually is not parallel with the rifle in the barrel. So you can't really tell, but because our rail is angled up a little bit, think of our rifle barrel being here and our scope is barely angled this way. So now when we're zeroing at 100 yards, we're going to have to bring the reticle up to that point. So now we could use more of our clicks. Hopefully that made sense. If it didn't, just take my word for it. 20 MOA is uh, very, very nice and beneficial. Uh, hopefully that made sense. If it doesn't, eventually it will. Eventually you'll be shooting long range. You're gonna run out of mills and then you'd wish that you had a little bit of a cant. So that's what that means. Hopefully you guys got it from my little explanation there. So that's it guys. That is everything here down. That is the rifle setup and how I came to this point right here. Now, just as important as the rifle certainly is the optics. So let's talk about the scope. A couple months back, I made a video with this exact setup right here in a video titled, The Best Long Range Precision Scope for Under $1,000. And I still stand by that between this scope series. This is an Arkin Optics EP4, specifically the four to 16 by 50. So what I have here is the Arkin Optics EP4 as well, but this is the six to 24 by 50, so a little bit more magnification. Let's break that all down, and then that way you'll be able to see just why I like these scopes so much for someone that may not know about optics too much. Let me explain. So this is, like I said, the six to 24 by 50. Let's break that down. Six to 24 is the zoom range. This right here is my zoom ring. I could go from six, seven, eight, nine, all the way to 24. So 24 X, that's my zoom. The 50 is the objective lens, this diameter right here. 
So this being a four to 16 has a little bit less zoom, but a little bit more flexibility on the bottom end. It's also got a 50 millimeter bell or objective lens. Uh, so the benefit on the zoom is self-explanatory as long as it's a good glass and you're zooming into a clean image. The zoom, fantastic. Objective lens, the larger it is, the more light that gets to be taken up into it, especially with good glass that's first and foremost. So this six to 24 by 50 is a very, very nice recipe. You'll see that along the uh, product lineups for other optic manufacturers as well. Six to, I'm sorry, four to 16 by 50, another great combination. So again, that zoom and then objective lens. There's one big division when it comes to picking a scope and that is gonna be the relativity or the, uh, the click values. You could get MOA, which stands for minute of angle or mills. Minute of angle, typically the scopes are based off quarter minute of angle adjustments, which as it turns out is just about a quarter of an inch. So one MOA is one inch at 100 yards. With that said, you know, four clicks will be then one inch at 100 yards. The other option is a mill radian scope or a mill scope. That's my preference, but it's not necessarily correct. Uh, there's plenty of people who choose either one for different purposes. I happen to have accidentally selected a mill scope when I got started because I thought that was the only option. That's what I learned on and now that's what I really know, but I could jump into an MOA and learn it just fine. That's not a problem. It's not like a language barrier, but a mill scope is uh, these right here, 10 clicks is one mil, which means each click is a 10th of that. Uh, you don't need to remember this. I know it sounds easy to remember a quarter of an inch at hundred yards. This happens to be 0.36 inch per click, which then means 3.6 inches at a thousand yards. You don't need to necessarily remember that at all. It's really just about what you practice with. I've got a lot of time with mill scope, so I'm pretty quick about adjusting my shots if I miss or, uh, or just kind of remembering what kind of range I need to be with the mill scope. From my experience, it seems like there's more options out there for mills than MOA, but everything's kind of coming around. For example, the Arcan Optics SH4 and the EP4, both of these EP4s were only available in mills for the longest time, and currently they still are, but they just announced that they're gonna be rolling out an MOA away scope here very very soon maybe by the time this video is live so that's pretty cool the next feature is whether it's a first focal plane or a second focal plane scope this might sound complex but it's actually not at all second focal plane is what most people that aren't just shooting might think all scopes are like as you zoom in the reticle stays the same but your image is getting larger you're only zooming into the image a first focal plane is preferred by most shooters, uh, certainly me. What that means is as you zoom in, you're zooming into your image, but the reticle is also getting larger. That's not just for show, that's purely to keep the relativity of all the hashes in the mills or minute of angle uh, the same. So you can always make an adjustment on the fly just based off your reticle. So that's pretty darn huge. And also for ranging targets and all that kind of stuff. First focal plane, hugely preferred for the longest time first focal planes uh, scopes had a huge price premium over second focal planes. It's gone to the point now to where actually they're uh, very, very competitively priced. The next big feature would be the tube diameter, what the rings actually clamp on this diameter right here, the main scope tube. That a lot of times for, uh, for the less expensive scopes or hunting optics that don't need a bunch of bells and whistles, it maybe is about one inch tube diameter. When you step up to more long range or kind of tactical scopes, they'll usually start off with 30 millimeter, sometimes one inch, but the next size up is definitely 30 millimeters. The benefit with the larger sizes is not only is it sometimes, not all the time, sometimes easier to look through, you get less of a straw-like tunneling effect, but also because they could actually pack in more adjustments so you can actually dial up a lot more. So that's the main benefit. The next size up from 30 millimeter is what we have here. That's why these things are unbelievable for their price, 34 millimeter. That's just about as large as it gets for the mainstream. There's a couple that are 35 and some even larger, but those are very, very like niche. 34 millimeter is what the big boys go for. You know, where I'm talking about Night Force, Attacker, and uh, Schmidt and Benders. They, they rock the 34 millimeter tube. So the fact that it's on these, it's kind of crazy. So hugely, hugely appreciated. Every scope nowadays has a zero reset. As long as it's got exposed turrets, you can always take the caps off and re-zero it, which I'll explain how to do once we get shooting. The next feature that not all scopes have, but when they do have it, it's awesome. And I think it should be absolutely just standard on scopes is a zero stop. Once you set your zero, then when you're dialing, it stops on that zero. So you can't over rotate and accidentally put it on the wrong zero. So that's huge. I'll explain that when we get shooting, but a zero stop is big time. So hopefully that sheds a little bit of light on what kind of features to look for in an optic that's best gonna work for you. Now that you guys kind of know a little bit more, again, these are both Arkin Optics EP4s. This is the four to 16, six to 24, both by 50. The reason I love them so much and I still think they're the best scope for under $1,000 and they're way under $1,000 
They both have 34 millimeter tubes. Both of them are first focal plane. So as you zoom in, you guys already know what that is. The reticle itself is awesome. They designed it themselves. They both have ED glass. So the glass quality is fantastic. And they both have lifetime transferable, no questions asked warranties as well. They're both 50 BMG rated, fog proof, waterproof, all the works. And get this, that one right there, the four to 16, about 550 bucks. The six to 24 is about 600 bucks. I will say though, they're in hot demand right now, rightfully so. I had to wait six weeks to get mine. That's about the lead time currently, but you can certainly still order one and I recommend you do. So I'll be sure to put a link in the description to where you guys can check out Arcan Optics. If you guys decide it's right for you, uh, I do have a coupon code, it's Texas Plinking. And what that does is get you free shipping. And it also, this is new, it gets you enrolled in a monthly scope giveaway. So if you win, you could get refunded for your scope or you could just get another scope, uh, choice is yours. But I thought I'd mention that, that's the scope. Uh, beyond that, uh, talking about Arcan Optics, they also make the rings and usually 34 millimeter scope rings go for like about 130 to $200 for decent ones. Uh, they make their own and they're of great quality. And these ones here are about $59.99. So all in all, it's like just a little too good to, uh, to be true, but I've been running them and I love them. All right, the next part is gonna be how to mount your scope to your rifle. And this is where I'm gonna save about 20 minutes off this video so it's not too long. Instead of showing you guys the process, I'm only gonna give you a couple tips and direct you guys to someone else that has made a much better video than I would right now. Um, real quickly, all I'm gonna say is, again, get a good rifle, get a good scope, get good rings, and then get a good torque wrench to torque it all down together because you don't want to just crank it down as tight as you can. Probably in the description of this video, I will link you guys to my favorite video I've seen so far on the subject of mounting a scope. Uh, I believe it's about a 12 minute or so video. It's under 15 minutes, probably about more than 10. Perfect video for mounting a scope. I highly recommend that. I'm just not gonna do it justice right now and let me just save the time. That is how we came up with this setup here. Real quickly, the last little thing I'll mention because I forgot to talk about it while I was out there shooting because I already did the shooting portion. Uh, another little accessory that's cool and they're not too expensive, a range finder. Uh, if you're gonna go to a dedicated range and they already tell you the range, not necessary, but if you're gonna go out on private property and set up some steel targets so you guys can know your range, this is a Nikon Monarch uh, 2000. They're really cool. Vortex makes some awesome ones for not a lot of money. They're just really good options out there. So just check them out. I'll probably link one. Uh, I don't think YouTube will get mad at me if I link a, uh, uh, a range finder in the description. So I'll put a link in the description to where you guys can get a nice range finder, but I'm talking under 250 bucks for a really good one. This one's really, really accurate out to 2000 yards. So just run it through real quickly once again, Factory Remington 700 AAC SD, 22 inch barrel, six five Creedmoor, Graybo Renegade stock, little Amazon pouch, I forgot who makes it, uh, Accurate Mag, Harris Bipod, Arkin rings, 34 millimeters, Arkin Optics EP4, six to 24 by 50, AAC brake. And in this pouch, I thought this was kind of cool. I just got a couple little spare rounds in here. So this thing's always ready to rock and roll. And that's pretty much how this rifle came to be. And if you price it all out, this sucker is just under $1,800 for the whole thing, kind of incredible. So let's see how it shoots. Actually, before that, I should probably mention how it became tan. Uh, pretty much, I wanted an exciting looking gun and I really liked the uh, kind of rattle can look. So it was just some Rust-Oleum uh, camo series of khaki and brown. And uh, you know, I kind of accept the nicks and ticks as they come because I think it looks kind of cool. Um, and then I just kind of mask off whatever. I took a lot of pictures along the way and I posted them to my Instagram on at uh, Texas Blinking. So check that out if you're interested, but I thought I'd mention that. Anywho, let's get to the shooting part. If you're not even hitting remotely close, it's gonna be kind of difficult. So the way you get remotely close before you shoot, you can do something called bore sighting. It's different with every rifle, Remington 700, you press up by the trigger and then out comes the entire bolt. And you could usually look through the barrel and try to zero your scope to where the center of the barrel is looking at at some distance. I can't do that because I already set my cheek um, piece here. So I'm not gonna bore sight. What I actually ended up doing is getting about maybe within 50 yards and then shooting on paper because the chances of being on paper then is a lot larger and then start zeroing it kind of roughly at that range, trying to have it, if anything, a little bit low because the scope sits higher than the barrel. So I did that, we're on paper. Now we just came back to 100 yards and let's take a shot and see where we are on our paper target top left. Very, very close. Let's go down range. I'll show you guys where I'm at and uh, what to do from here. All right, so like I said, when you're at 100 yards, the chances of being on paper is pretty slim. One thing that can help you out is just get a really, really big target. So that way your margin for error stretches out as well. 
these shots here, I was aiming here and I was a little low. That's when I was happy. These were my 25 yard uh, shots off camera. And when I was getting aiming here, getting a little low, that's when I was happy because I knew when I went out to 100 yards, it would start to even out because of that four axis. Um, so that was at 25 yards. This was my shot at 100 yards, aiming for the very center here. And actually my elevation looks perfect. So I kind of got lucky there. Uh, pretty good guess. My windage is off just a little bit. How to make that correction. Um, there's a few ways to go about it. It's pretty darn easy. And it depends if you have mills or MOA. Here, we've got a uh, target from LaRue that's a, a half inch grid. So these little squares are half an inch. So from here, that is half one, looks like about one and a quarter inch. So if I need to make a windage correction going left one and a quarter inches, if you have an MOA scope, your clicks are a quarter of an inch already. So it's probably gonna be about five clicks. A mill scope uh, happens to be 0.36 uh, inch per click. Uh, so you could just divide this. So if I need to do, you know, one and a quarter inch that divided by 0.36, or instead of doing that, I can just look at my reticle. If it's a informative enough reticle, that's why I love that reticle and that EP4. I could just look how far it is to the right while holding center and I could see exactly where the bullet's impacting and I don't even have to come up to the uh, target and measure it out. I could just do it all from the scope. So I thought I'd kind of show you guys that, but I'll probably put some graph and, uh, and everything with the reticle so I can make that make more sense. But pretty much, and the same is true when we go long range, wherever you miss, you can make the correction by seeing exactly how many mils you are off by windage and elevation and making the correction through the scope just based off the reticle. So that's why I like a first focal plane informative reticle personally. All right, so another thing that I need to mention is you saw the bullet was to the right of where I was aiming. Where you dial as far as left, right, up, down, think about it as telling the bullet where to go. You're obviously only moving the reticle, but think about it as if you're moving the bullet. So I need to bring it to the left. I need to bring the bullet left. So on the dial, you'll see if it says right to the left, we'll go left about one, two, three, Where we sit now is we have actually that's empty a rifle that is zeroed. However, the scope doesn't reflect that. My elevation is on 6.8. My windage is on 0.2. That was actually pretty close. Now, every scope is different, but in the case of the EP4 6 to 24 and the other arc and optics and many scopes, they're pretty similar. We're gonna first uh, reset the zero to where the zeros show where the rifle is zeroed out. Let's go ahead and do that. All right, so like I said, we are reflected about 0.2 to the left here. We need to bring that to zero. Uh, Arkin includes this little Allen key, but I'm sure you guys probably already have one. What we're gonna do is loosen this, this, and how many are there? There's three on this model here. So don't back them all the way out, but make sure that when you're doing this, hold it steady so you don't accidentally click it somewhere. So we're just gonna back this out to where it starts kind of protruding to the top, right about there is pretty good. We're gonna do that on all three. So now with all three of them backed out, but not removed, this is actually free to pop out. So we can, without even popping out, we could just go ahead and place it back on that zero. And this is where we start tightening. So get it ready to start tightening here. And make sure you're precisely on that hash, right where that zero is. All right, that looks pretty dead on. I'm gonna start cranking down a little bit. Yeah, I'm pretty happy with that. Let's go ahead and get the other three screws. So we just backed that one out to about right here. And then the silver screw, we go ahead and tighten down all the way until it hits the wall, which is about right here. And then we can back it out just a little bit, about a quarter turn, maybe a little bit less. And then we tighten down the brass. Again, nothing crazy, just finger tight. And then now we can elevation up and then it stops right on our zero. We can click around here and then when we're zeroed on, obviously this doesn't have a windage stop because you could be dialing for wind at any moment. Uh, elevation, it starts at the 100, we could go all the way up and then we know it's gonna crank down and stop on our 100 yard zero. So that's the zero stop. That's the way you do it on the Arkin Optics EP4 in particular. Every scope's different so you can look into it. They make it pretty darn simple on these EP4s though. So now we are zeroed at 100, zero is set, zero stop is set. Now we can start plugging in some information to a ballistic calculator and getting out to some range calculated. All right, so we're backed out here on the ridge. I've got two targets, one at 455 yards, one at 686. Uh, pretty long range, but nothing like too uh, extravagant. It's, uh, it's enough to prove the point on kind of like dialing and putting information in a ballistic calculator to dial for elevation and all that kind of stuff. Um, as far as a uh, ballistic calculator, you could go out and spend a lot of money on a Kestrel weather station. 
You can also just get a free app if you have a phone. It's called Bullet Drop, or you can just go online and go on Hornady's website and plug in ballistic information there. However you do it, um, it, it'll work about the same. And it's more so just like a guideline of what to reference a shot. And, uh, and from then on, it's about jotting down exactly what happens because your rifle might be different. That said, here's some information to get you started. Velocity, FPS, feet per second. That's usually on the box itself. It tells you it might be in a 24 inch barrel or something else. So if we're shooting a 22 inch barrel, you're gonna have to lose velocity. So that's gonna be some trial and error. Bullet weight, that's gonna be on the box. Obviously we're doing 140 grain. Ballistic coefficient, that's not usually on the box, but you can go on Hornady's website or Rover makes the ammunition and they'll give you the specs on that specific round. Ballistic coefficient is how efficient it flies through the air and how aerodynamic it is. Sight height, that is the height in inches between the bore of the rifle and the center tube of the scope. So I believe I already did this one here, that ended up being about two point, a like two and a quarter inches, but that way it knows about bore axis and it calculates that, uh, takes it into account for long range shooting. So you have your sight height, zero range, 100 yards. Wind speed, you could put zero initially and kind of like play around later, but uh, if you're gonna dial for wind, uh, wind speed, direction, um, shooting angle, if you're shooting up or down at a certain angle, it's gonna be as if you're shooting a shorter range. Right now, we're just gonna say as if it's flat because we're not gonna get too crazy with it. Altitude, where you're shooting. Uh, many times you could just go ahead and go on your phone and then just ask Siri or whoever you uh, got helping you out. What's the altitude? It appears you're at 1,063 feet. 1,063 feet, I'll take it, it's probably close enough. Humidity, that's another one you could just do this. Humidity. Twenty-six percent. We'll plug that in, and then lastly, barometric pressure. That's something a Kestrel weather station will pick up as well, or you could just go barometric pressure. The barometric pressure is currently twenty-nine point eight nine inches of mercury. I don't know what that means, but my calculator asked for it. I'm going to plug it in. So that's all the information. Plug it into a ballistic calculator and then start putting where it says at range, 455 yards. At the moment, I think it said it's about 2.4 or so. So we're gonna go ahead and just shoot a little bit. I'd rather spend some time at 686 yards with this kind of rifle. So let's confirm it at 455 and uh, see how we do. Look like a hit on the uh, upper part of it. I don't know if it's worth making a correction. I might just go one down and then just go for center mass, but that was a good hit. Let's go center mass here. I realized I kind of aimed a little bit towards the top section on that one, but that was a really good hit, I think. So 2.1 seems to be exactly where I'm hitting at 455. And I put a little bit of uh, medical tape here and I labeled 455 and it's empty next to it. I'm just gonna go ahead and write down 2.1 for my reference. And then uh, we'll see what 686 says. That's how you should approach the ballistic calculator. It's a reference to get in the vicinity, but when you make a miss, see where you miss, make the correction. If you have an informative reticle, like I said, you can see where you missed and make the correction from there. Uh, when you have good hits, write it down and that's your information for your dope chart. Right now, I'm happy with how it's doing at 455. Let's jump to 686 and uh, get some consecutive hits. All right, so uh, locked in at 686 yards and uh, I did a couple shots off camera and I think I put in that the velocity was too slow because it seems that I have to dial back down a little bit. I haven't tried with this new dope. I think 4.5 mils at 686 will do me pretty well. So let's go ahead and try it. Windage is gonna be another thing. I think it's pushing off to the left a little bit. Let me go ahead and try to bring it to the right. Maybe 0.2, we'll see what that does. Very nice. Right now, 0.2 to the right for wind and 4.5 elevation gets me right on. Yeah, those look like really good hits actually. Nice. That's something that you could just write down and that should be pretty repeatable. 
uh, temperature and seasonal changes might differentiate a little bit, but for the most part, that's pretty repeatable. Wind, however, is what really takes practice as well as just getting a good shot off. So I got this little tab here. I'm gonna go ahead and write down where I was at, 2.1 and 4.5. That way that's always repeatable. I'm gonna go home, plug in some information, correct my velocity, because I don't have a chronograph and um, to where these numbers start matching up. And I'm gonna put a new sheet on the side of the gun. So that way we'll just have a gun that's uh, ready to rock and roll at any moment because I got the, uh, the chart on the side for my shooting conditions. I hope that this video served as a good tool to go from zero knowledge to surface level enough on every little aspect on how to get out here shooting long range without just lobbing bullets and you know uh, just trying to get lucky or whatever. This is a calculated way to get out there with this surface level knowledge, you guys could go as far as you want. And if I just kind of went to surface level on one subject in particular, uh, I promise you there's probably way in depth videos on, uh, on those subjects alone. That said, I hope this served as, uh, I don't know, beneficial to you guys, but that's about it for the tutorial. I'm gonna shoot around some more.